end with comments. I'm actually gonna open up with conversation and then we'll pivot into the text, all right? So let's pray. I know we got a small number tonight. I'm gonna continue to keep this data, see if Tuesday nights are no longer a good alternative night. Um, we started off good last couple of weeks started to, you know, to wane. And I'm, you know, I know everybody's busy. We got work. We got we rushing back on. I, I get all that stuff. So I'm not like judging or pointing fingers. I think it's just important to kind of keep that data, keep the metrics so that we know like, okay, this works, but this doesn't work. And if it doesn't work, how can we go back to the, to the drawing board? All right. So y'all help me keep attendance and, 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 and keep these numbers locked in so that we know if we need to revisit, revisit our, our plan. All right. Let's pray. God, we thank you for everybody gathered here today. We thank you for everyone that is present. We thank you for everyone that was invited, that couldn't make it. We thank you for every person that's up against a challenge right now that has a heart or desire to be here. Touch them even now with favor as if they were present. I pray now that your word douses us. I pray that your, your spirit, your pure Holy Spirit from heaven, that it inundates us, oh God, I want us to feel a true and full endowment of your power, oh God, not just for me as teacher, as instructor, but I pray that, that everyone that is present will feel a revelation, will feel a light turn on, will feel their brain and their spirit activated, oh God, from what is taught and deposited today. I pray that it's something tangible, something that lasts them for their lives, something that they know comes from heaven and that will never make them doubt that you are real, that you are present, and that you are on our side. Oh God of the universe, God of the multiverse, God of everything we see with our eyes and things we cannot see, oh Yahweh, of heaven and of earth, we call upon your power and we summon the heavens, asking that even in this small virtual space, you open up your wisdom, let the floodgates of heaven open up, that there is no question that can go unanswered, but that we get clarity, that we get, that we get comfort, that we get conviction, that we receive healing, that we receive deliverance from old, negative, antiquated ways that have hindered our effectiveness in the gospel. Oh God, we bless your name. And I ask that anything that I may have done that may get in the way of this space, of your free flow, I pray that you get me out the way and let your will be done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, gang, let's, let's, let's get to it. Let's get to it. So, woo, so the last couple of weeks, so we've been dealing with, this is how we do it. This is how we do it. This is how we, are, how we read and deal with the Bible and deal with scripture. This is how we uh, uh, handle and analyze. This is how we should read the word. So that my whole aim for this, this lesson over the next couple of weeks will be not just the previous weeks, but in the weeks to come, just to give us some back to basic baseline understandings of how to understand the word of God. In the first week, we started off with the origin of scripture, how, do you, how we understand and interpret the origin of scripture. And we pivoted to how it was arranged, and why the arrangement is important. And then we got into its authority. We dealt with the authority of scripture and last week, wow, I can't believe it's been four weeks. And last week, we dealt with how to approach it. Okay, the mindset, the heart, and the way to understand how we approach it. Okay. I want to pivot into interpretation. Okay. How do we interpret the scripture? This is, let me say this now. We will have to leave here with some... Um, I would call it lack of closure. And what I mean by that is not everything will be just fully availed because some of it is process, right? Some of it is journey. So I wanna be super duper clear that, that not everything will just be fully availed, but I do believe that that tonight some, some powerful things will be deposited on you, okay? Um, and deposited in you, I should say. So let's, let's, let's talk a little bit, let's talk a little bit. Let's have an open, judgment-free zone conversation, all right? Judgment-free zone. We're going to have a judgment-free zone conversation. 
when you have trouble reading the word of God or remaining consistent with the word of God, what are some of the reasons? And we're talking you personally. Don't, you know, don't think like what I want you to say or what other people, you know, what might be common amongst other people. Just blow up the chat feature. Or if you want to expound on it, you can also unmute yourself. When you lack consistency, because we all get there and have those moments. When you lack consistency with the word of God or with reading the word of God, what's the biggest barrier? Like, what is the, the biggest reason that you say stops you? from being consistent with the word of God in terms of reading it. <laughs> you can, once again, you can use the chat feature or if there's something you just wanna um, come off the mic and say, that's cool too. <laughs> I don't feel like I'm growing. That's good. That's, that's vulnerable. Thank you for sharing that, Amanda. Michelle, uh, you jumped off mute. You wanna, you wanna say something? Yeah. Uh, I kind of piggyback off Amanda and plus a lot of it's timing for me like yeah. should I do it now should I wait then I'm like oh, well, I'll do it tomorrow mm. oh, when nobody's here you see and like that's my problem timing and sometimes it, it just feel like I'm going nowhere like I'm stuck mm. yeah that's good that's good and that could be just that could be discouraging because time is Time is time is not only money, but time is just time is precious. Time is precious. Time is precious. So feeling like it's being wasted is a big thing. Thank y'all for, for the honesty and the vulnerability. I love it. Sam, you agree? Which one you agree with? Shanique or with Michelle? <clears throat> I see Shanique dropped something in the chat too. Oh, sorry. I was agreeing with Michelle. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And Shanique says, simply not being intentional about keeping discipline. I like that one too, because th that one tells me there's desire, right? But I'm just not making the, I'm not making the time for it. There's desire there, but I'm not making the time for it. I think all of those answers, they, 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 they indicate desire. They indicate desire. Um, so that's good. That's good. That's good. I'm not going to lie. Last week and this week, there's going to be some overlap not in terms of the scriptures we referenced, but just in terms of some of the things I say, because I think approach and interpretation are very closely related. They're different things, but they're very closely related. And what I mean by that is last week, we talked a lot about uh, Paul and Timothy, Paul and Timothy's uh, relationship and how Timothy, uh, how <clears throat> in order for him to do ministry with Paul, Paul had to circumcise him at a very, very late age. Right. So a lot of his past and the reason that was because because his father was Greek, but his mother and grandmother were Jewish. So since his father had the last word, his father didn't follow the Jewish customs. So Paul is like, hey, if we're going to go witness to these people, you kind of got to have certain customs done. And Timothy is, is almost a grown man. And he's like, yo, I got to circumcise you something that should have happened when I was a baby. And we talked about that pain. We talked about that cutting. Right. And, and, and having to 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 have something that you should have had done at a, at a younger year have to be dealt with at a later year just for you to be able to go forward in your, in your power and in your authority. And when we talk about the scriptures, there's going to be a lot that we deal with that's going to cut us deep, but it's really going to cut us because we're going to feel like, why didn't they tell me this when I was younger? <laughs> it's going to be stuff we learn and dig into when it comes to interpretation that we're going to be like, they didn't teach me that in Sunday school. Or they taught me, but they didn't say it this way. Or they didn't interpret it this way. So we're going to unpack a lot of circumcising that should have cutting and pulling back that should have happened in our younger years. Okay? And some of it's going to hurt. Some of it's going to feel painful internally. But as Amanda addressed, you're going to want to, you're going to grow from this. You're going to grow from this. Um, so I, I appreciate that. I don't want to cut anybody off. What, what Any other reasons? We got consistency or, or, or discipline, rather. Uh, not feeling like we're growing. Michelle kind of talked about not feeling like she's growing and timing. So timing, right? Making the space for it. Anything else that, that's left out of there that's, or that wants to be built upon out of the ones that's already been stated? Either use the chat or, or, or come off mute, anybody? 
No pressure. Just want to make sure I ain't forgetting nothing. Not understanding. It's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah, I was waiting. I thought that would have been one of the first ones. Yeah, I thought that would have been one of the first ones. That's good. Not understanding. Not understanding. All right. So uh, the reason I'm bringing this stuff up is because all of these things can be solved with the right interpretation. All of these things that we address can be solved with the proper interpretation. Okay. Now, I want to say this. I heard this from a mentor of mine, and I want to repeat it to y'all. Um, he said, how God's word is interpreted can determine how much power it actually has to use it. Okay. He may have said it a little bit different, but that's kind of how I got it in my notes. How God's word is interpreted can determine how much power it really has when you try to use it or apply it, okay? Because a lot of times <clears throat> the application is wrong because of poor interpretation, okay? I'm gonna say that again. A lot of times the application of a scripture is wrong because of poor interpretation, right? So when we don't have interpretive skills, what ends up happening is it, ca it can't be used for what I want to use it for or what I think God has called us to use it for if, if the interpretation is wrong. Okay? Now, if I say, if I say, <clears throat> hey, Sammy, can you run to the counter? Go pass me the key. It's going to help me open the door. And Sammy runs to the counter and she gets me the key. But she thought I said floor and not door. Guess what's going to happen? Sammy going to think that that thing, if she has no prior knowledge of the key, she's going to stick it in the floor and be trying to figure out why the floor won't come up. Why is nothing opening? Didn't you say the key was open in the floor? No, I said door. Right. So so when you have little or or no pre-existing knowledge about something, then 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 the trying to use that thing becomes ineffective. You, the, drop a one if that's making sense. If I have little to no previous knowledge of a thing but i attempt to use it because somebody misinformed me i limit what it can do okay so the proper interpretation and analysis of the scriptures actually opens up the fullness of the power of the scriptures okay because if i have poor and improper interpretation, I cannot apply what the scripture is for. Okay, let's go. I'm going to go to an example. Let's go to an example. Um, a matter of fact, hold off on that. I'm going I'm to get to that example real quick. Let me say this one thing. Let me say this one thing. Also, I have this quote here. And it says, when it comes to scriptural interpretation, now this is going to shake your theology, so bear with me, bear with me, okay? <laughs> we'll dig into it. The quote says, when it comes to, 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 to interpreting biblical scripture, no one will do it perfectly, but we can do it accurately. All right? And I said something similar in previous weeks, which is interesting. Now I'm going to break it down. They said, no one can do it perfectly, but we can do it accurately. Okay. And I know you're like, well, what does that mean if it's accurate and it's perfect, right? If it's perfect and it's accurate. And not really. Okay. Something can be imperfect, but still accurate because it's heading in the right direction. Okay. So here's what I'm saying. 
we can understand the outcome God wants out of a text, even if we don't understand all the details that's being spoken about in the text. So let me give you an example. If I go to Revelation, if I go to the book of Revelation, where God is speaking prophetically to the uh, to, to, to John on this Isle of Patmos, and he's by our, and he's by himself, right? And I'm gonna get to that, Amanda. We're gonna get to that. You 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 spot on, but I'm gonna get to that. And he's in this eye, he's on this Isle of Patmos, and he's by himself, and he writes the book of Revelation because the Holy Spirit endows him and he, he writes all these things that are to come. And he talks about these seven churches. He talks about these seven churches, right? If if I go read about the seven churches, I'll see that every church had a different issue. Okay. Now, I may not understand everything and all the signs that John is writing about perfectly, but I can accurately see that God is saying every church got a different issue. So now I can accurately say that that is something that transfers over into our world today. So I don't get every single thing about the seven churches right away like why are there seven what is he talking about are these churches in heaven are these churches on earth right there's so much context i may not get everything perfect but what i can get accurate is the heart behind what god is talking about i talked about this last week i believe it's romans 16 16 right where paul tells the greeks to greet each other with a holy kiss greet your brother your sister with a holy kiss right but if we try to do that in april 2020 People are slapping us across our face because of COVID. And if we took that, that scripture literally to try to make it just perfect, we would have got COVID, gave COVID, or been making other people feel uncomfortable about how we greet them. A perfect interpretation or an attempt at a perfect interpretation would say, I'm going to kiss you no matter what. And you might not be comfortable with that. But what's the heart? What's the accurate interpretation? What, what the scripture is trying to say or what the, what the message or the heart behind what the scripture wants us to learn and extrapolate out of it is that there should be some expression that's comfortable with both the, the two of us that lets me know the love of God greets the love of God. That might be a hug for us. It might be a pound, my bro, my sis, what's good? It might be a kiss. But if we try to take all of that without any context and without any interpretive analysis, we'd go around making people uncomfortable. <laughs> Are y'all with me? All right, we're going we to get into this a little more. All right, we're going to get into this a little more. Amanda, let's go to, uh, 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 I want to go to Philippians 4 and 13. I'm going to go to Philippians 4 and 13. As you pull it up, I'm going to talk about man. So Amanda said in the chat, y'all, I'm going to just read it just in case you missed it. I also think that we interpret based on our experiences. I love that. Do you know what that's called? I'm going to give y'all a theological term. That's called constructive theology. Okay. That's called constructive theology. All right. <clears throat> One of the, and I talked about him before, one of the fathers of constructive theology, or forefathers, I should say, is James Cone. Okay. Um, inter interpreting scripture with your experience, right? James Cone is one of the fathers of theology, and what he says. I mean, I'm sorry, it's not father of theology, one of the fathers of constructive theology. And what constructive theology is, it's an alternative way to look at somebody's, to look at scriptures through the lens of somebody's experience. What, 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 what was his argument? He made a case that, that white people or people of privilege cannot understand the ways of Jesus here in America, unless they see the black person on the lynching tree back in slavery and Jim Crow as, as a, a sign of what Jesus went through. 
In other words, the black experience in America was so harmful to us that the only way white people can really know Jesus is to repent to black people because Jesus represented what black people went through during slavery times. So constructive theology is, 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 is to bring your experience and, and how you look at scriptures through your lens. So another good example would be Harriet Tubman. The insight Harriet Tubman would give me and give us if she was to preach from the children of Israel getting freed from slavery, just being a former slave who helped liberate others, the, the, the power that would emanate from her is it, it'll probably probably have been, so she's dead, I can't say probably be, but it would have probably been, I mean, light years more powerful than anything any of us could ever reflect or represent in a sermon because of her context. Does that make sense? So essentially, it's, it's not that we should come to scripture without our context. We should come to it with our context because if we serve a Christ that does not understand our experience, it's hard to call him our savior. <laughs> Let's we'll say that again. If we serve a Christ that doesn't understand our experience, it's hard to call him a savior. He's a savior because he saves from what he's aware you're in or have dealt with or what your soul has faced. Right now, there's limits to that. And we're not going to I don't want I don't want to go too off track. But to to Amanda's point, yes, it is important to bring your context, to bring your uh, your experience with you to scripture. But it's also important to remain an open vessel to say, God, what do you want me to see in this? Okay, because you don't want to overly analyze scripture from so from such a self-centered lens that you that you that you never fully embrace what what God might want to do. That's new. Does that make sense? Um, I hope that helps with your question, Amanda, but feel free to still, no, you can come off mute and, and, and ask it if you still want to jump there, go there I'm not before sure we go to the scripture. Like, I'm not sure if this is like a question, really it is a question. How do we know if we're improperly um, analyzing scripture? Because if we're all applying it or if we're all going in with like cultural context, mm -hmm. does that speak to like, the beauty of the Bible, like how it, how we can all relate to it, or does it speak to, or is it more of a reflection that we need to dig deeper to see what the scripture really means, if that makes sense? Because we don't want to apply it too much to our own culture, cultural or personal experiences that we remove it from its intended purpose, but was it written to apply to all of us? Mm -hmm. if that makes sense absolutely no that's that's a, an amazing question and i think that it's both okay it's 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 both okay um <laughs> that is the beauty of the word that is the beauty of the word that when i read I can understand it at a deeper level as I mature and grow as a person and as a believer. Okay. So that's one thing. Um, hold on. So something in the, Oh yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. Thank you for that reference. Um, Jess. Um, that when I, when I read that, uh, I'll always grow if I'm willing to let God speak to me, right? Like I'll, 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 I'll constantly grow in the word and I'll see things from perspectives and in depth that I've never seen it. There's a reason your pastor has been preaching for 30 years. Well, not even preaching. He's been pastoring for 30 years, but preaching for more. And yet we still get fresh words from him, right? There's a reason I've been preaching for 16 years and yet I'm still giving new sermons because I can go back and there's, it's more about it being depth than it is about it being different. I hope, I hope that makes sense. It's not that there's 
something new there is that it's deeper. And as we grow, we can see more, we can understand that depth. Okay, almost like a pool, right? Like right now, if I get in a two foot pool, that thing is, is, it ain't going nowhere. But I can go to four feet, I can go five feet, right? Right, we get to six feet now, I'm like in the water, so it's right at my head. But at the same time, my point is, the, 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 the pool's depth hasn't changed. It's, it goes from two all the way down to six from the beginning since they put the water in it. But as I grow, I can go in deeper waters. Does that, that make sense? Drop a one if that makes sense. So it's not that the scriptures themselves are giving us new things. It's that as I grow, I can go deeper into what's or what already exists. Okay. So there are some theologians that would argue it's impossible to interpret scripture without cultural context. And there's another school of thought that says, hey, uh, you know, similarly to Jess's book that she put in the, in the, in the messages, remove all cultural, um, uh, you know, lenses because it wasn't written in our culture, right? But as we talked about two weeks ago, there was something we said last week and two weeks ago that the Bible does not dictate culture. It transcends it. So that means it's big enough to have principles that are still relevant in our culture and big enough to have principles that were relevant back then. Okay. So to answer your question more concretely, Amanda, um, this is, we kind of going to get into it. So I don't want to like, like jump too much, but I'm, I, I, because I've been talking a lot, I'm going to just like jump to a little bit of the ending. Um, th this is where it's super important to make sure you're approaching scripture with both prayer and, 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 and a level of, of clear headedness and meditation, right? Because when you're, when you're diving in, there's going to be things in your culture that you have to, you have to look at it through your culture for, and I'm going to say it this way, for instance, for instance, Hebrews tells us that when somebody is incarcerated, when, when a person is incarcerated, that we should think about that person as if we ourselves are in jail. When a person is, this is in the book of Hebrews, when a person is incarcerated, we should think about that person as if it's ourselves in the jail. And we currently live in a nation, presently, who has the highest imprisonment rate in the world. We have the most prisoners behind bars than any country in the world. Third world countries, poor countries, broke countries, affluent countries. I know third world is not culturally, politically appropriate anymore. I don't know what the renewed term for that is. But, uh, yo, we have, we're so punitive as a nation. Because when someone commits a crime, we no longer see them as people. So if I don't read Hebrews and have that context, I'm going to ignore what God tells me to do about prisoners. This is why if you don't have a heart for people who have grown up in context that, that mess up their mind and spirits and put them in circumstances where crime is their only answer, then you don't have the heart that the scripture is saying we should have about them. And that has to do with our culture presently, right? But there's a reason it was also written thousands of years ago. So how did it have to do it then? What's the heart behind it? The heart behind it is that when people get in power, they take advantage of people who don't have power. And the lens we have to look and our mission and our missives and our work and our callings through is one that says no matter how much financial or economic power I have, I'll always be able to look out, to care for, to take care of somebody that's in a, that's in a disadvantaged situation. How many people behind bars but, 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 but are, are innocent? How many people like Khalif Browder, may God rest his soul, went to jail for something they didn't do, didn't have the money to see a judge right away, 
and ended up getting in fights and, 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 and having to protect themselves while being incarcerated, while in detention centers. And then they went crazy. And then now they are in jail for crimes, but they didn't go to jail for crimes. That can plague the mind. That can plague the body. And I don't want to make this about the prison industrial system or complex system. Like, but but I, I, what I'm pointing out is we can't completely detach the culture from the scripture because the scriptures transcend culture. So you don't want culture to be your primary guide. But you can't detach the culture completely because then we'd overlook some of the missions we're supposed to have in this present day. Like what the scriptures say about immigrants and the care we're supposed to have for them. What the scriptures say about broken poor people while we're in an economic recession. We got to be aware of that stuff. And that's current culture. But the culture is not the guide for how I got those principles. The Bible is the guide for how I approach the culture. I'm going to say that again. The culture is not our guide for how we interpret scripture. I realize I ain't been giving y'all no, 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 no. So I've been running through this. The culture is not our guide for how we interpret scripture. The scripture is our guide or our lens for how we address the issues in culture. So the scriptures have an answer for the culture. The culture does not have an answer for my scriptures. Okay. All right. All right. Y'all messing me up. Y'all messing me up. <laughs> so here we go. Here we go. Here's why interpretation can be dangerous when done wrong. We talked about its limitations, but now let's talk about its damage. We talked about the power it could limit when we read it wrong. But what about its damage? Man, pull up Philippians 4 and 13 for me. Pull up Philippians 4 and 13. Philippians 4 and 13. Sammy, would you be able to read that for me? I feel like you got a, you got a strong voice today. I feel like you on blast. <laughs> I don't even know if she's in a position to be able to read. Oh, she, her mic. she can read. Hallelujah. <laughs> let me get verse 13, Sam. 13. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. All right. Boom. So let's hold that there. Let's hold that there. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. King James Version or New King James say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, right? Just off the top of your head, tell me how you've heard that used and preached in church. Just anybody, shoot it. Just as many sermons as you've had, as many times you heard preachers hollering, just give me a couple ways you've heard that used. Anybody. Like what kind of context do preachers usually use this, this scripture with? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I mean, just to be very cliche, just when you're facing a battle of any kind, sickness mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. on a job or whatever it is, like mm -hmm. trust mm -hmm. in God, you can overcome. You know, it sounds cliche. But if you trust in God, he, he'll he take care of the battle for you. Like he'll, he got right. the situation. Right. So that's, so, so I see, I, I just, just, Overcoming obstacles. There you go, Brit Brat. Brokenness, right? Or broken, yeah, brokenness, right? So here we go. So here we go. Here's why this is so dangerous, y'all. Because wrong interpretation creates ungodly. No, I shouldn't say ungodly. Wrong interpretation, write this down, creates unbiblical expectations, okay? Wrong interpretation creates unbiblical expectations. I'm just putting it in the chat. Wrong interpretation creates unbiblical expectations. Where'd the scripture go? I need that, I need that. We ain't done with that. I can't tell if it was my screen or not. Yeah, leave that up there. I need that. I need that. All right. Wrong interpretation. And here's what I mean by that. Now, this scripture, y'all said it. It's used to talk about brokenness. I can overcome. Uh, I, I, I can, you know, face obstacles. Wrong interpretation. 
Verse 12 says, <laughs> I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I'm going to say that again. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, here's where this becomes dangerous, because if I begin to quote and decree and declare and call out this scripture, when somebody is coming to me asking for prayer because their body is sick, I'm not tapping into the real energy and spirit behind this verse. So now I'm quoting it and misapplying it because that has nothing to do with being healed from your body. Look at what this says. Paul is saying, whether I'm broke or whether I have money, I've learned that Christ can be with me in any situation. So now we've been using this verse to encourage people who are coming out of situations, trying to tell them you can come out of a situation because you can do all things. When Paul is really saying, I can be in any situation because I can do all things. Do you <laughs> do, do y'all understand what, what it, do y'all understand the difference? So, so, so you, you've heard it preached to tell us God can take us out of anything. And does it mean that that's not true? No, of course he can. But is this the scripture that we want to align with that God principle? And this is not it. This is not it. I can give you, I can, I can give you a few scriptures that, that, that supports God pulling you out of something. I can give you a couple, but this one isn't it. This is for a circumstance when somebody's in a situation that God is actually not getting them out of. He's saying, when I'm broke, I've learned to be content. When I have a lot, I've learned to be content. Because no matter what God is doing through me, I can do all things. What is the all things? I can live in all situations as long as Christ is strengthened in me. I've lived check to check. And guess what? I'm still here. <laughs> I lived with a little bit of food in my, in, my, in my refrigerator. And guess what? I'm still here. I lived with excess in my refrigerator where I was giving food out. And guess what? I'm still here. So what Paul is saying, look at verse 10. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. What is he talking about? That while he was going through a physical trial in his life, that the people were sending him gifts. And what was his response? His response was, even when I didn't have, Christ was still strengthening me. Even when I had a little bit, Christ was still strengthening me. Even when I had a medium amount, Christ was still strengthening me. Even when I had, now that I have a lot, because y'all y'all sent me new gifts, Christ is still strengthening me. So is there good news in this text? Yes. But this is just one of many examples of how if we misinterpret it, we can't tap into its real power and it can be dangerous because then we can, then people can start quoting scriptures for things that is not their situation. So they're not even speaking with the authority of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to a situation because this scripture don't got to do with their specific thing. Come on, that's called, I call it spiritual malpractice. We got to read context. I call it spiritual malpractice. Because guess what? 
If you went to the doctor, God forbid, but if you went to the doctor because you stubbed your toe and he thought he was giving you a pain relief medicine, but he made a mistake and gave you some kind of treatment for, 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 for I don't know, multiple sclerosis, it's going to damage your body because he's giving you a diagnosis, I mean, he's giving you medicine for a diagnosis that is not in your chart. That does more damage than it does good. So if I start giving you prescriptions with these scriptures and we use it for the wrong thing, that misapplication is spiritual malpractice. The same way you can sue your doctor for medical malpractice, you we need to be checking our preachers and saying, yo, this ain't what that say, bro, sis. Can we have a conversation about this? I'm going to give you another one. I'm going to give you another one. Go to Romans 4 and 17 for me, Amanda. Romans 4 and 17. <laughs> Let me get another voice to read that. Let me get another voice to read that. I think it's 4 and 17. Yeah, let me get somebody to read that for me. This is a good one. Woo! This is a good one. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. So stop. This is where we get that scripture. Speak those things that be not as though they were. <laughs> who does it say does that somebody put it in the chat who does it say does that who speaks things as though they were not who calls into being things that were not this says God did it this says God does it huh so, so watch this. Here's where we got to get to the heart, right? Because most people have good intention. You can be, you can have good intention and bad interpretation. Okay. It's not just preachers and teachers. This is everybody. Even when we read it, we can have good intention with bad interpretation. I'm putting it in the chat just in case you want your notes. Right. So now we got a bunch of people calling things that be not as though they were. Now, does that mean, because remember, we talked about watch what you say. So let's go back to our previous series. Does that mean I don't have the power to speak things and for them to manifest? No, it does not mean that. It does not mean you don't have that authority. Through the Holy Ghost power, yes, you have that authority. Here's what this scripture is talking about, though. I don't know if it's my computer. They keep going away. Yeah, there we go. Here's what this scripture is talking about. He is our father in the sight of God, talking about Abraham, in whom we believe the God who gives life to the dead. So right now, Paul is is addressing um, previous people that have died before the coming of Christ, okay? I'm not gonna get into the entirety of the context, but he's talking about the possibility of their souls being saved. And so what are some of the works and things they, they have done? Um, what are some of the works and things they have done in the Old Testament that'll still qualify them um, even though Jesus in the flesh has not come yet, right? Check this out. What Paul is talking about, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Go to Genesis 1, Manda, for me, please. <laughs> I'm about to mess y'all head up, but I'm going to give us some power too, though. So it says, in the beginning, God created. In the beginning, God created. Okay? That word created. Okay? That word created. In the Hebrew, that word is bara. Bara. Okay? Bara. 
It literally is the ability to have nothing pre-existing and to make something come out of it. That's where magicians get the term abara, bara, bara, kadabra. What a, what a magician is really saying, Abba, Father. It's a lot of Hebrew going on. Abba, Father, Bara. Uh, 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 to, to, to bring something out of nothing. Saying, Father, bring something out of nothing. So when a, when, a, when a magician is bringing a rabbit out of a hat, what he's literally saying is, there's not supposed to be a rabbit in his hat. I'm bringing something out of nothing. Abba, Kadabra. Kadabra, that has to do with body or corpus. That's where they get the word cadaver from, from like a dead body. Right? Abba, ka, abba ra. If you really break it down and pull it apart. Yeah, it's a lot going on, right? I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a lot happening. It's a lot happening. But Abba, Father, Bora, to bring something out of nothing, Kadabra, a body of something, Kadaver or Kadabra. Okay? Abra, Kadabra means to bring something out of nothing. <laughs> or father bring something out of nothing. It literally comes from the Hebrew, which is what God did in Genesis. Mm -mm -mm. So what Paul is talking about in Romans 4 and 17, he's not referring to the power we have for us to call a job that we don't have. Because guess what? The job still exists. We're just trying to call it to us. Hmm? For us to speak healing over ourselves. Guess what? Healing still exists. We're just trying to call it to us. So that's not the same thing Paul is talking about in Romans 4 and 17. Paul is referencing what God is dealing with in Genesis 1. And only God can do that create. Which is why as humans, when we have babies, we procreate. God produces, we reproduce. Because everything that we've made, invented, or what we call created has come from something that already existed. Peanut butter still needed a plant that God made exist called peanuts. Hmm? From lights that needed electricity, from, from inventions that use wood or copper or water. Even if it's an invention, it's an invention of things that already exist that we put together and made them work for something. But in the beginning, God created bara. That word means to bring nothing out of something. So in Romans 4 and 17, when Paul talks about speaking those things that be not as though they were, he was saying what God did in Genesis. And now I can go to Job. <laughs> I know this is a lot. Now I can go to Job. And Job says, his friends tell him, thou shalt decree a thing. And so shall it be established. And the light of God will shine upon your ways. But once again, that's not the bara. That's not calling something out of nothing. That's saying, if I decree or declare something that exists in my realm with heavenly power, I can have it. Mm -hmm. So now we got people in, in Philippians 4 and 13 saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me to help them win a basketball game. No disrespect to, you know, players out there that, that I know a couple players in the NBA that, you know, put Philippians 4 and 13 and write it on their sneakers and put it on stuff. And sure, it's inspirational, but that's not its context. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, that's, that's just not its context. Okay? So, 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 improper interpretation can cause unbiblical expectations. So now people are running a 5K or a 10K marathon saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me to help them get out of their fatigue and help them get out of their and sure, it's, it's, if, if you need to inspire yourself to make it through your race and that works, do your thing. God ain't mad at you. You ain't going to hell. I just want y'all to have good interpret interpretive skills. You got to pull out a different, you got to, um, 
like I said, you got the Job one. Um, go to Psalm, um, go to Psalm fifty-five real quick. Let me see something in Psalm fifty-five. Might have something for you. <clears throat> Might have something for you. Right. So I would say this, like if you're in suffering, right? Something like, or you're or you're nervous and you and you using Philippians 4 and 13 to get you out of like nervousness or fear about taking this. I can do all things because you can do something, you know what I mean? Um you can start at like verse five of Psalm 55, fear and trembling have beset me, horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove, I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away, stay in the desert. I will hurry to my place of shelter, far from the tempest and the storm. Right? Keep going down. Because um, that's actually not the verse I'm looking for, but there's fear up there. Um, da -da -da, go down, go down some more. Sorry. <laughs> so I would start like verse 16. As for me, I call to God and the Lord saves me. Right? I call to God and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, noon, I cry in distress and he hears my voice. He rescues me unharmed from the battle waged against me. Right? Like you can use something like that when you're up under attack. Right? Go to, go to Proverbs 18 and 10. Proverbs 18 and 10. I hope y'all took that verse down. Sorry. Psalm 55, verses 17, 16 through 18. Proverbs 18 and 10. The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Right? You're looking for some security for some, you know? If it's, if it's about a financial thing that you want God to bring you out of, you can use some of the Proverbs that talk about, you know, finances. Um you could even go to Philippians 4 and 19. Let's get this down. Philippians 4 and 19. Put me on the spot, man. <laughs> I guess that's what I'm doing this for, right? And God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. God will meet all your needs. <laughs> and God will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Okay. So those are just a few, you know, and it's not, I'm going to get it twisted. Once again, like if I'm going through a situation and I'm in it, right, I'm in it. And you trying to like, listen, I don't have no deliverance from it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's a great scripture to use for something that like, you don't know when you're coming out, but you know that you need God while you in it right now. That's a great scripture to use. It's a great scripture to use. But here's, I'm not attacking just those couple of scriptures, right? The Romans 4 and 17 and the Philippians 4 and 13. I, this happens a lot. So the heart at what I'm getting at, I want to make it super duper clear, is that when you're reading, make sure you're reading context. So you're reading above it. A lot of times we like to extrapolate just that one thing and isolate that one text, right? But we, we got to read above, around it. Because watch this, sometimes the interpretation is right, but when we read that context, oh, it just goes to a different level. It just goes to a different level. So it's not even a matter of it being wrong all the time that a preacher preaches or like, like I'm not attacking preachers and stuff like that. It's not even about it being wrong all the time. Sometimes it's right, but when we have more context, the way we understand it is different. For instance, when Jesus told the disciples, I'm going to a place, I'm going to a place. I'm going to prepare a mansion for you. I'm going to prepare a mansion. For you. I think that's John 14. Um, Mandy, could you go to John 14? I think that's John 14. I believe so. Don't, don't kill me if I'm not. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. Now, that sounds great, right? Like we're taught like, okay, cool. We got a place in glory in heaven for us, right? Here's why this is so 
dope when you understand context interpretive analysis like when jesus says this he's speaking to a jewish audience as we know and what we don't know about like jewish marriages is that like when a husband and wife before they got married when they were engaged the husband in jewish culture in, the, in those times families didn't really like go away from each other they like built communities within each other if that makes sense so the uh, the son of a father when he got married he would build his house on top of his dad's house and prepare it before he gets married so that when he gets married after his betrothal period as they called it but we call it engagement after the engagement period when they're married he brings her back to his father's house but it's really their own house that he's built on top of his father's house. Having that context in Jewish culture takes that scripture to a whole new depth. It's like Jesus is, is, is literally becoming our husband and going to build a space where his father lives. He's, he's, he's going to prepare something for us. Like that kind of depth is different. Go to, um, what is this? Go to Isaiah chapter 54 real quick, Mina. Cause some stuff is not wrong, but it has depth. I think go to verse, I wanna say 17, 16 or 17. Oh, it is, it is, it is. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is so good. Watch this. This is God talking to the prophet, right? See, it is I who created the blacksmith, who fans the coals into flame, and who forges a weapon fit for its work. And it is I who have created the destroyer to wreak havoc. No weapon formed against you will prevail or will prosper, and you will refute every tongue that rises up against you or that accuses you, as this text says. Let, let, let me, oh my gosh, this is so crazy. Yeah, I can, uh, uh, no weapon formed against me will prosper is fire. That's a great inspirational, encouraging text. But here's what interpretive analysis does that takes this to a whole new depth. And when it takes it deeper, it doesn't make us more studious. It makes my love for God bigger because it just shows the things he went through to try to love me. Watch this. In this context, it's speaking specifically of a weapon of war. It's using a metaphor of a weapon of war. And God is saying, even the blacksmith who was making the weapons or giving the materials for the weapons, I made him. <laughs> even the person that wants to take that weapon and use it to destroy you, I made him. So anything that could come against you might look like it's above you, but it's still under God. So even the stuff that look bigger than me is still under my God. So when I'm up against metaphoric, economic, financial wars, God is saying, don't forget who made the people and the stuff that they do in war with. I got this under control. They can't mess with you because I made them. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. It's totally different when it start hitting like this. Because I'm interpreting with a lens that says, let me look at everything around it. So when I look at the fact that God made the blacksmith, the fact that he made the man who's in war, the fact that he made the iron, the flames and everything that they're using to make the weapons, that gives, uh, I feel like shouting, that gives me a different kind of confidence when I go into a battle. When I go into warfare, because even the stuff that's up against me was made by the one that I'm serving.
is different. It hits different when we interpret it with context. Okay, I got to bring this to a close. I didn't even get to my last three points. But what we don't want to do is have chronic frustration. Okay, we do not want chronic frustration. Some of us are living, and I'm, oh, I'm, I'm praying for a destruction of the yokes of chronic frustration. Our frustration is not necessarily with God. Our frustration is with how we were told something in the word of God is supposed to, what we've been told, what we, sorry, my sentence is all over the place. What we've been told about something in the word of God. Our frustration is we think we're applying something right but because of poor interpretation, we have misapplication. Because of poor interpretation, we have misapplication. And then what that does is that makes us frustrated because we start trying to think about why God's stuff ain't working. But it's not that God's stuff is not working. It's that unfortunately, we've been interpreting wrong because we've been taught wrong. Or we got too many voices of authority in our lives that aren't spending time in prayer and with the word of God. Okay. Whew. Let me close out with this because I want to destroy the yoke of chronic frustration with the word of God. I want to restore in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I speak, oh God, in the name of Jesus. So I just got to declare that over your lives. I see a newfound love, like you're dating somebody new, a newfound love with the word of God, butterflies in your stomach, true conviction and change, true depth of, of application in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. All right, watch this, y'all. Watch this, y'all, because we got to go. Go to 2 Timothy 2 and 15, Manda. 2 Timothy 2 and 15. 2 Timothy 2 and 15. Okay, so here we go. So King James would say, study to show yourself an approved workman unto God. This says, do your best to present yourself. The God is one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who, who correctly handles the word of truth. It says study. It says study. It says study. That word study in the Hebrew is spudatso. Spudatso. I'm going to put it, not that you care to look up Hebrew. I mean, Greek, I should have said, sorry. This is actually Greek, not Hebrew, but... Spudatso, okay? And that word spudatso literally means to, to hasten quickly or to exert oneself. I'm gonna tell you why, this, why that's so good. Why that's so good. Because studying the word of God requires collaboration and partnership. It does not require you just leaning and waiting on God only. And it does not require you overly studying, but never leaning and waiting on God. It requires collaboration. It requires both. Spudatso, that exerting of oneself, that word study is to immerse yourself, to diligently exert oneself, to hasten to exert oneself. That means it takes my energy to understand this word. It takes my effort to understand this word. Okay. And it says, study to show yourself an approved workman, approved, approved. What does it mean to be approved? What does it mean to be approved? That word is dokimos, dokimos. Okay. And what, what, what dokimos is, it, re it refers to uh, when like a, a, a merchant, like somebody that's like at a marketplace, like when they, uh, uh, 
when they do, oh, you, oh, I got a good example. You know, when you go to the grocery store and they got the markers, if you use a big, a bill that's too big and they, and they do the thing to check if the, if the bill is right, right? If, if, if it's real, then it's approved, they take it, right? Back then, there was no, like, the bartering system wasn't the same. So people, if they didn't have rice or if they didn't have cattle and stuff to exchange, they would use, they would like find precious metals, okay? And they would melt it down. And they would melt it down. And depending on how good of a quality they shape the metal, that determined if a merchant would take it. If it was, a, if it was in bad shape, they consider it counterfeit. So even though you made the money at home, everybody making their own money, everybody got their own printing press, <laughs> everybody making their own money, certain merchants wouldn't accept it if they didn't believe the coin was, was cut or shaved down in the right way. So it wouldn't be approved. That's what dokimos is here, that word approval. So in other words, study so that you're not counterfeit. Exert yourself, apply your energy so that you ain't one of these fake counterfeit Christians out here don't know what they're talking about. You believe what you believe because you know it's real, right? That's why the worker doesn't have to be ashamed. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, who correctly handles the word, correctly handles it. How can I correctly handle it? Because I've been through an approval process through my study. Huh? Now, here's where, and it's the last scripture I'm going to give you. Here's where you know it requires collaboration. Go to Romans. Uh, no, no, no. Don't go to Romans. Go Galatians 1. Go to Galatians 1. Galatians 1. Let's go to verse 11. I'm tired of hearing myself. Can I get a new reader? Who read already? Shanique read. Sammy read. Let me get somebody else. Read verse 11 for me. Right. And, and 12. 11 and 12. I yeah. want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. Slow that and down. Then, Slow that down. Say that again. That the gospel I preach is what? Not of human origin. Didn't come from man. Go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by the revelation from Jesus Christ. Ha! The gospel I preach did not come from human origin. Meaning, when he interprets scriptures and he gives it out, what he's saying is, the encounter I had was directly with God. Okay, so Galatians 1 and 11 tells us God intervenes. 2 Timothy 2 and 15 tells us exert ourselves. Proper interpretation requires a collaborative effort between you and your almighty God. There are certain things he's going to divinely deposit. And there's other things that will be divinely deposited, but the revelation doesn't come until you steep yourself in an exertion, a willingness, a hasten to learn. Okay, so I'm going to leave us. No more scriptures, but I want to leave us with a couple of resources. Okay. We'll leave us with a couple of resources. All right. So a good app to have. I said it the other week. You can do Greek and Hebrew word studies on this. It's a little difficult to, it's not difficult. I shouldn't say that. I don't want to like get y'all nervous about it. It's not difficult, but it's like, it's hard to find. But once you find how to use it, it's, it's like a cakewalk. All right. So you want to use for, this is, for like just people just starting out, the Blue Letter Bible. Blue Letter Bible is an app on your phone. You can do Hebrew and Greek word studies on there. You just got to touch the scripture, download it. You tell them what version you want, whatever. Old Testament, New Testament, you touch the scripture. And it, that scripture, you go to the interlinear concordance, and it gives you a breakdown of every every word. Now, this is not the most thorough of, of books on language and word studies and stuff like that but it's a good way to start. It's a good way to start. For my book people, Easton's Bible Dictionary, which you can also find online for free. Throw that out there. You do not necessarily need to buy it. You can actually find it online for free. Easton's 
Bible dictionary, one of the most comprehensive Bible dictionaries that you could use. Um, it, it really, 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 um, yeah, it, it, it just, it just helps. <laughs> it just helps. It helps a lot with, uh, um, with, with word studies as well. All right. Here's a, here's a website you may want to use as a resource as well. Told y'all, told y'all, I'm gonna give y'all some resources. I told you the first week you want to use studylight.org. Studylight.org has different resources on it. You can do word studies and you can do, they have, they don't just have Easton's, but they have other Bible dictionaries. So you can see different interpretation of Bible dictionaries. Most of the time they're the same, but they have like, like different depths. So it's like some people are a little more scholarly. So like, oh, I, don't, I can't get through all of this. Somebody make it plainer for me. They have different like um, Bible dictionaries. So studylight.org is a good website for um, word studies and for like, uh, why am I having a brain fart? Sorry, I had a long day at work. <laughs> Y'all know I started this internship at this church, but now I'm in the building. So like I'm in the building like Tuesday through Friday and then also Sunday mornings. I'm having a brain fart right now. Study like that or helps you with word studies and with, um, and it has the Bible dictionaries from different people on there. Yes. All right. Um, those are just three to start. I don't want to overwhelm you. Those are just three to start. I'm going to give you a fourth, but I'm not going to be specific about this one. I'm going to say this. Try your best. If you want, if you can invest in yourself, try your best to not just use your Bible app as your source for reading scripture. Here's why. Most of us use the generic Bible app that like, you know, gives us a scripture for the day. Everybody, there's millions of people across the world reading it. There's a couple things. It's good that you have something coming in. If you just need a quick word, you need to read that real quick, that's fine. You want to be mindful of letting somebody else's revelation dictate to you where God is taking you with your study. And if you just rely on your scripture of the day from the Bible app, you don't lean on the spirit and the voice of God to guide you where he wants you to read. Okay. So I recommend you getting, and plus with the Bible app, here's another, this is more practical. This is not like to shut them down because they're doing great things. Right. Sometimes they give like little sermons during the day, but you don't want to use them because they help. They take away from your discernment. You're not able to like discern if God wants you to be actually in uh, uh, whatever. What's the scripture for today? Because uh, I got the widget on my phone. So the scripture for today is Matthew six and seven. Right. Why are you praying? Do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. You may not be struggling with prayer in this season, so you might not need that for the day. So you just read something that didn't do nothing for you. So I say that to say. You don't want to necessarily just depend on them as your source for your study. OK, my recommendation is that you get yourself a Bible that has commentary, a commentary Bible. OK, because then you can be reading along with it gives you some interpretation. OK, some commentary Bibles I recommend. I'm going to put them. I'm going to put them. Um, the Harper Collins Study Bible is a good recommendation. Putting all this for y'all. I'm giving y'all free game. Y'all about to be preachers. These are all my study materials. I'm giving it to y'all. Um, the Nelson's New King James. Great, great, great um, commentary. It gives you good context. Nelson's New King James. Um, uh oh i got another one the book is huge though so you know that's if you're you know if you're a geek like me like a bible nerd like me then you'll you'll like this one too the dakes annotated reference bible okay um it's another good one that just came out. It's a little more common and current. Tony Evans, the great Tony Evans, Dr. Tony Evans. Man, Tony Evans' sermons got me through the pandemic. I ain't going to lie. Tony Evans was preaching straight from his house, and he was blessing me through the, through the pandemic. Um, he just came out with his own Bible a couple years ago. 
not his own interpretation, but he just adds his own commentary. So the Tony Evans commentary Bible. Okay, all of these are easily findable on Amazon and stuff like that. Invest in yourself. You know what I'm saying? Invest in yourself. If you don't want to depend on the Bible app because it don't have as many study tools. You know what I'm saying? You don't have as many study tools. So. Yeah, it got like, the letters all small on the Nelson's show because it, it's so daggone. Uh, it's so I'm, much writing. I got glasses in it. and I got to use a magnifying glass. <laughs> they they, they got to have some bigger print ones ones out there I i'm sure they do. A big one too that one is the william mcdonald okay um i have that one believe it's bible commentary i have that one too good 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 so yeah that's that's my recommendation so what i said i gave you a couple things okay studylight.org use it when you want to know what a word means don't go don't drive yourself we're a little late over time but listen to this don't drive yourself crazy i want to give you some practical stuff i know i fed you spiritual i want to give you some practical stuff don't drive yourself crazy trying to look up every word like in the beginning, in what does that mean in Hebrew? The what does that mean in Hebrew? <laughs> beginning, what does that mean? There? Don't do that, don't do that. Let me give you a shortcut. Let me give you a shortcut while you start. Start with the verbs, like the action words that are happening. Okay, start with the verbs. What are the what are the what are the Hebrew roots of these verbs? Or if it's New Testament, what are the Greek roots of these verbs? That's an easier way to look at it because the context of I and Matthew or John, like it, that doesn't matter. Like very rarely do you need to like fully unpack the name of the person unless it's like relevant to the scripture, like like Barabbas being, you know, the one that they chose. I mean, Jesus being the one they chose over Barabbas, that's significant because Bar means son of and Abbas is another form of Abba, like father. So son of the father, son of God. So it's interesting that Jesus replaced somebody named son of God. So that's that's when names, it's like interesting, you know what I mean? Because it also means that when he replaces him, anybody he replaces becomes a son of God too. So we are all kind of like Barabbas. If you know the story of Barabbas, he was the one that was, he was Jesus' cellmate when Jesus was locked up waiting for his hearing. I'm sorry, I'm giving y'all too much information. Listen, <laughs> but I just thought that was interesting. Barabbas, son of the father, son of God. So when Jesus replaces Barabbas and they say crucify Jesus instead of Barabbas, when Barabbas is the one that should have been crucified, Barabbas really means all the sons of God get replaced by this one, Jesus, who is the begotten son of God, all right? Little, little Bible nuggets for y'all, okay? But other than that, most of the time, the name, you don't gotta break that, the nouns, it's not that it's not important, but don't overwhelm yourself. Start with the verbs. So if it says Jesus fed, okay, fed, what does that mean? Okay, such and such created. Okay, what does that mean? You know what I mean? Try to start with the verbs. Try to look at look into the regions and stuff. What was going on at that time? So use Bible commentaries. Use studylight.org. Use Eastern Bible Dictionary. All of these can be found online. Blue Letter app, put that right on your phone. You can go to the Bible right on your phone. Touch a scripture. Look up the Hebrew, if it's Old Testament, look up the Greek, giving y'all all, I'm giving y'all game, giving y'all game, feel me? This, this is stuff we all need access to. This is stuff we all need access to, okay? So go through, I'm gonna give y'all like 20 seconds, go through the chat feature and try to find, you know, whatever you want to take notes of and screenshot it if you didn't get a chance to already. Um, but this is for the people that, you know, that's really hungry. Um, so let's close out. And I want to close out talking about what we started off with, those barriers. Some of those barriers were, I um, don't feel like I'm growing. Well, guess what? With these tools and with prayer, like Galatians 1 says, some of it's going to be divinely inserted. And in 2 Timothy 2, some of it I'm exerting myself and my own energy. I'm saying, I'm going to get up and I'm going to look, even if I read two verses. Okay? You'll feel like you're growing when you know what you're reading more. So get some of these tools, get some of these websites and apps and start putting them to use. Start putting them to use, learning, breaking down, reading, understanding, and having the right interpretation. All right, y'all. Uh, I love you. I'm not going to spend too much time waiting for questions unless there's something pressing. Um, but... Um, yeah, I hope this was a blessing. 
I hope that y'all were fed by this both spiritually and practically. My goal was to be practical and spiritual in this lesson because I feel like, you know, a lot of this, I ain't that, I ain't smarter than y'all. I'm just accessing more stuff. And when you couple that with a prayer life, God will do some crazy things in how you read the scripture. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. So we haven't stayed this late for a while. I haven't gone past 830 in quite a while, but I love y'all and um, let's pray out. And if there's anybody that has questions, I'll stay, but just for a few minutes, um, just because it's already late. So I won't stay too, too long. Okay. Let's pray y'all. Eternal and gracious God, thank you for your few you have gathered here, the warriors that are rising up. Oh God, I ask that you do a new thing in this season. Oh, God, I feel a new season coming upon us. I feel a new season coming upon us for in Joshua chapter three. Oh, God, your word said that you told them to follow the Ark of the Covenant because it's passing by a way that they have not passed through yet. Oh, God. And I pray right now that as the Ark represented the spirit, help us to follow your spirit because you're taken us into a season into a way that we haven't been through yet i speak that a season of increased finance that we haven't been to yet a season of increased faith and wisdom in your word that we haven't been to yet a season of increased favor that we haven't been through yet a season of 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 healthier relationships that we haven't been through yet a season of restored purified and 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 strengthened relationship with our children or our relatives that we haven't seen yet Oh, God, our Father, I pray for a new season. It's a new day. Let a fresh anointing come our way. A season of power and prosperity. It's a new season. Come into me. Come into all of us who are gathered here. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I gang, much, much, much love. Um, I'll hang out for a little bit. If y'all have questions, feel free to log off. But if you do, if you do have a question, I didn't want to hold everybody up by taking a couple questions.